I want to ask you a question this morning. In light of God's greatness, why are you not trusting him more? And what would your life look like if you did? Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Nehemiah chapter 2 as we continue our series that I've entitled Rise Up. How we as believers in Christ now rising up to the challenge of our spiritual pilgrimage, the journey that is ahead. And so we are packing our spiritual tool belts with the tools that we need for a spiritual rebuilding process that might be taking place in your life, might be taking place in your family, might be taking place where you serve. And I want to talk to you this morning about rising up in faith. So Nehemiah chapter 2, look with me, beginning in verse 1. During the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I'd never been sad in the king's presence before. So the king said to me, why are you sad? When, when you aren't sick, there's nothing here but sadness of heart. And I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, may the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates are destroyed with fire? And then the king asked me, what is your request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor with you, Send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you return? And so I gave him a definite time. It pleased the king to send me. I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters written for the governors of the region west of the Euphrates River so that they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. Let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to rebuild the gates of the, king, of the temple's fortress, the city wall, and the home where I will live. And the king granted my requests, for the gracious hand of God was on me. I went to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates and gave them the king's letters, and the king also sent officers of the infantry and cavalry with me. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard that someone had come to pursue the prosperity of the Israelites, they were greatly displeased. After I arrived in Jerusalem, I'd been there three days. I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't let anyone know what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the one I was riding. I went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem, and they'd been broken down, and its gates were destroyed with fire. I went on to the fountain gate in the king's pool, but further down it had become so narrow for my animal to go through, so I went up by night by the way of the valley and inspected the wall. And then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. The officials didn't know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So I said to them, You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall so that we will no longer be a disgrace. I told them how the gracious hand of God had been on me and what the king had said to me. And they said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do the good work. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard this, they mocked and despised us and said, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And I gave them this reply. The God of the heavens is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building, but you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Several years ago, the Today Show had a special 
in which they highlighted 10 skills that every person needs in life. 10 skills. And they talked about changing a tire, sewing a button, ironing a shirt, figuring out your taxes or a tip, and all these things that are really pretty helpful things for people to know. Those are 10 good things that you should know. More importantly, as we're walking through the book of Nehemiah, we're going to see 10 things we all need spiritually for the spiritual rebuilding process that God will begin. Today, we're going to talk about another of those tools. Last week, we talked about rising up in prayer and how important it is for us as believers to spend time in prayer with God, how we need that regular, constant conversation with God. Now, this morning, we're going to continue rebuilding as we talk about rising up in faith. Now, Nehemiah is a fascinating book. It's, it's a remarkable story. There are great lessons in leadership throughout the book of Nehemiah, but really, I don't, I'm not studying the book of Nehemiah together so that we can learn about leadership or so that we can learn about the marvelous story. I want to study the book of Nehemiah with you so that we learn more about faith. We learn more about what God is asking of us and what God might want to do through us. The writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because whoever comes to him must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So without faith, the writer of Hebrews says, it is impossible, not improbable, not unlikely, not, uh, not rare. It is impossible to please God without faith. So we're going to pack another tool in our spiritual toolbox this morning as we talk about rebuilding in faith. So I want to talk about what faith is and what faith looks like, what faith means in a spiritual journey, what faith would look like in our lives if we were to pack faith along our journey. The first thing that I want you to notice from Nehemiah chapter 2 is faith means waiting on God's time. God's time. You ever prayed and waited? And you prayed for a season and, and God didn't seem to step in when you thought God was going to step in. And maybe you grew impatient. Maybe you forgot. Maybe you moved on to something else, but really forgot about what it was that you had asked God for. But I want us to see this morning, faith means waiting on God's time. Now, Nehemiah gives us a time scale here in the first verse of Nehemiah chapter 2. And for reference, you need to go across the page to Nehemiah chapter 1. So, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, during the month of Kislev. All right, so Kislev is sometime around November, December. Now, chapter 2, verse 1, during the month of Nisan. All right, so Nisan is sometime around March, April. Last week we saw the story of when Hanani comes. Hanani was Nehemiah's brother, and Nehemiah, Nehemiah heard from his brother how bad things had gotten in Jerusalem. So we learn when Hanani comes, how we respond to the difficult seasons of our lives. But this morning, I want to look at after Hanani leaves. Because Hanani came, and he brought bad news. And as best we can tell between Nehemiah chapter 1 and Nehemiah chapter 2, Hanani went back to Jerusalem, and Nehemiah was there, and he was praying. How long did Nehemiah pray? Well, he prayed four months. Nehemiah chapter 1 tells us that he prayed and he fasted and he mourned and so he was diligent in that season of prayer. He prayed and he prayed for four months. When was the last time you prayed for four months for God to step in? Where you prayed and you kept on praying for God to do something in your life, like Abraham believing God for a 25-year-old promise, claiming the word of God, the message of God, because faith is believing God without giving him a deadline. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to trust God's way. I'm going to trust God's time. Faith means waiting on God's time. But notice, not just praying, Nehemiah was fasting 
The Bible tells us, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept, and I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, I had a thought this week that I guess I'd never thought of before. Nehemiah, remember his occupation? We learned at the last verse of chapter 1, he's the cupbearer to the king, which doesn't just mean he's the wine taster. He's something of a bodyguard. He's something of a person who is trusted by the king, who probably tastes the food, he tastes the wine, before the king consumes it, because if someone wants to poison the king, they'll probably do that through the food. And so the cupbearer had a unique and remarkable responsibility. But it struck me this week, if your job is eating food, fasting can be dangerous. I mean, my job is to eat the food before the king consumes the food. But Nehemiah said, I fasted and prayed. And Nehemiah's been praying now for four months, waiting on God's time. Are you waiting on God's time this morning? Maybe you've called out something, a burden that you have, and you've called it out before the Lord. God hasn't answered yet. But let me just tell you on the truth of God's word, God's not stalling, God's not confused, God's waiting for the right time. And faith means waiting on God without giving God a deadline. But while you're praying, I want you to note some things. Notice what the Bible says as we get through chapter 2 and move down into uh, the interaction between Nehemiah and Artaxerxes. Nehemiah actually gives us a couple of emotions here that he had. The first emotion that he had was sadness. And somehow in his season of ministry, and even these last four months, Nehemiah said, I was never sad in the presence of the king before, but something happened. Was he, was he overwhelmed with a burden for, for his people today? Was there something that came up? Did more news come? But for some reason on this day, Nehemiah is so sad, his face reflects it. I was sad. And the king noticed it. Why are you sad, Nehemiah? You're not sick. This is sadness of heart. He's so sad that even when he's trying to hide it, everybody knows that he's sad. But then notice the second emotion that Nehemiah describes. Right after he was found out that he was sad in the presence of the king, Nehemiah says, now I was overwhelmed with fear. So he's sad and he's afraid. And all of a sudden, he's given an opportunity. The Lord hasn't answered yet. He's still waiting on God's time. But all of a sudden, a moment, an opportunity comes when the king looks at him and he says, what is your request? And so we learn a lesson here in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4, while I'm waiting on God. And here it is. When you're given a chance to speak, pray first. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4. The king asked, asked me, what is, what is your request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I love that verse. Nehemiah says, I was talking to the king, but I was praying to the king of kings. While I'm considering what I'm going to say to him, I was talking to him. More important than my conversation with Arguably the most powerful man on the earth is my conversation with the God of the universe. So while I was talking with Artaxerxes, I was praying to God. So when you're given a chance to speak, pray first. And you call out to the Lord. The king said, what do you want me to do for you? Isn't that an amazing question? What do you want me to do for you, Nehemiah? Nehemiah's ready. He's got an answer. He's got, he's got an idea. He's got something that he's apparently been doing in the meantime. And so Nehemiah says, if it pleases the king and your servants found favor with you, send me to Judah, to the city where my ancestors are buried, so that I may rebuild it. What is your request? I want you to send me. Nehemiah begins to unfold the request that no doubt he has been thinking about for four months. What is your request? It startled me as I read those words again this week as the king, the most powerful human 
in that day said to Nehemiah, what do you want? And I had this thought. I was thinking about Solomon when Solomon was first made king and God spoke to Solomon in a dream and said, Solomon, what do you want me to do for you? Solomon had an answer. I need wisdom. Or there's that moment in Mark chapter 10 when Jesus was passing through the city and there was a blind man and the blind man called out to Jesus and Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the man had an answer. I want to see. And in this moment, in this opportunity, as Nehemiah has been praying and waiting for four months, he's been spending that time coming up with an idea. What do you want me to do for you? I want you to send me. But here's what struck me this week. If God somehow were to communicate to you, what do you want me to do for you? What is your answer? What do you want me to do for you? The God who has unlimited resources, who can do anything that he chooses to do, what do you want me to do? Nehemiah's heart, his burden is for the city. I want you to send me. I want you to use me. So Nehemiah now believing, claiming by faith, waiting for God to open the door, but still believing and trusting in God. A commitment to serve while I'm waiting to be sent. A commitment to be faithful while I'm waiting for God to answer. Faith means waiting on God's time. Let me share with you a second thing that we learn as we follow through in, in Nehemiah chapter 2, really verses 5 down through about verse 10. Faith means anticipating God's yes. Faith means anticipating God's yes. So we learned something else that Nehemiah was doing in those four months. He was not just praying and fasting. He was planning. So all of this time, while Nehemiah was there waiting on whatever time God had, he didn't initiate this. All he did was show up to work sad one day. And God did all the rest. But somehow we learn that in the meantime, in these last four months, Nehemiah has been planning, he's been organizing, he's been thinking for four months, planning on God answering and planning on what he's going to do when God does. Jesus said this way in Luke 14, verse 28, nobody building a building doesn't first sit down and calculate whether or not I have enough resources to finish the building. You plan. If you're going to build a building, if you're going to buy a house, if you're going to do some kind of construction, you first plan. You live your life as though God will answer. Faith is anticipating God's yes, even if I don't yet see it. You see, Nehemiah is ready with an answer. The king said, what do you want me to do for you? So, the king, so, so Nehemiah says, well, if it, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight. Now, we learned something else Nehemiah has been doing for four months. He's been being faithful in his job. I'm waiting on God to step in. I'm anticipating that God will. But in the meantime, apparently, Nehemiah has been faithful, and we know that because he stakes his future on the fact that Nehemiah has been doing his job. Look at verse 5. If it pleases the king and if your servants found favor with you, send me. In other words, Nehemiah is saying, look, if I've been doing my job, which parenthetically, I have been doing my job because you and I are both alive. But if I've been doing my job and you're pleased with my work, I have a request. So now, Nehemiah, who has been faithful, now hears the king with a blank check. What do you want me to do? Prayer in faith is in the anticipation of God's yes. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not advocating a careless, selfish kind of name it, claim it, prosperity gospel. That is not what I'm teaching. That's not biblical, and that's not what the Bible passage here is saying. It's not saying that God somehow does anything and everything you want whenever you want it. This is not about your plan. It's about God's plan. But there is something about faith 
and believing that God will say yes. Do you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said in John chapter 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you wish and it will be done for you. Or the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, faith is the substance of what we hope for and it is the evidence of what we don't see. You say, I've been praying and God hasn't yet, God hasn't yet answered. Faith is your evidence. I'm waiting for God to step in. Faith is your tangible source of evidence in the meantime. I'm believing by faith that God's going to answer. I'm claiming by faith God's goodness. I don't see it yet, but I believe in the one whom I have asked. Jesus said in John chapter 20, verse 29, Blessed are those who have not yet seen and still believe. Faith is praying with the courage to believe before you see. See, faith is anticipating God's yes. So let me just suggest to you something. When you're faith facing big crises, pray big prayers. All right? Do you, do you see what Nehemiah is doing here? I'm facing a big crisis. It's, it's big. It's bigger than I even knew. It's bigger than I could have imagined. I'm facing a big need. So the answer is, I'm going to start praying big prayers. Listen, God is not only obligated to answer your little prayers. Sometimes, when you're facing a big need, when you're facing a big crisis, we need to pray some big prayers. The psalmist said in Psalm 84, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Jesus said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could relocate this mountain. So I just want to confess to you today, I'm beginning to pray big things for our church. I'm beginning to ask God to do big things. I'm asking God to bring more people to faith in Christ. I'm asking God for resources to accomplish the purposes I believe God has for our church. I'm asking God to pay off the debt. I'm asking God for the ability to do missions work literally around the world. I'm believing that and praying big prayers. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm praying. Faith means claiming God's yes. So Nehemiah is asking God for favor from the king. And now all of a sudden he begins to see that and so he takes full advantage of the king's openness. What do you want me to do for you? Well, I have an answer, king. I have a list of things. And so he begins to ask, I need money, I need time, and I need stuff. So that's, that's what he said. I, I need time away, so you're going to have to excuse me. That's what he means by send me. Now, ultimately, we learn when we get to Nehemiah chapter 13, Artaxerxes sent Nehemiah twice. I need you to send me. I need you to give me some money. I need some letters so that I can have passage between here and there. And I need some stuff. So I, 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 need, I, need, I need wood. Uh, I need stuff to rebuild the temple, the, the walls. I'm going to build me a house there. So I need some stuff. And so the king said, what do you want? Well, I need a lot of stuff. I need you to write some letters. I need you to give me some money. I need some people who will go with me to protect me. And I need some stuff. And he just begins to pour out. And, and then notice what, what Nehemiah says. The gracious hand of God was on me. I, I, I love that thought. Nehemiah says, I'm just calling out to the Lord, asking big things of this king, and the king granted my, my request. You know why the king granted my request? Because the gracious hand of God was on me. Remember the last time you felt the gracious hand of God? Nehemiah now testifying for everyone who will ever read this moment. The king said yes, because the gracious hand of God was on me. Allstate says you're in good hands with Allstate. And that might be true for insurance. But it's not the ultimate hands I want to be in. The king granted my request because the gracious hand of God was on me. Faith is confidence 
before the outcome is evident. Faith is believing God will answer even when I have not yet seen it. We don't control what God does or when God does it, but you can trust God will be faithful to his word. Faith is anticipating God's yes. Let me tell you a third thing that we learned from the book of Nehemiah chapter 2. Faith is trusting God enough to act on what he told you. So if I'm anticipating that God is going to say yes, then the very next step of faith is I'm going to then demonstrate the willingness to do something about what I just believed God is going to do for me. So beginning in verse 11 down through verse 18, we understand how Nehemiah begins to carry out this plan that he's been working on now for four months. He's not put any work into it yet other than the planning process, but now all of a sudden, he's beginning to put feet to his faith. Do you know the difference between faith and trust? Faith is intellectually believing something. Trust is doing something about it. I trust that the pew is going to support my weight, and I sit down on it. I could intellectually believe it and never do anything about it, but I trust it when I do something about it. You say, I I believe in God. So what are we doing about that? James says, you show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. I'll demonstrate what I believe about God by how I live, by what I do. Faith is putting feet to what we have said we believe. The presence of faith does not mean the absence of work. It means the willingness to step in. So Nehemiah has been planning, he's been organizing, he's been communicating, and then there came a moment when he had to saddle up his donkey and get to work. And we see Nehemiah, when nobody else was there, only a few people with him, in the middle of the night, got on his donkey, and he began to, to ride around that wall of the city until he, the donkey couldn't go any further. I got off my donkey and I just, came, I just kept on walking because there's going to come a point in faith where you and I are just going to have to saddle up our donkey and go to work. Where I'm going to have to do something about what I say I believe. Otherwise, my faith is just intellectual certainty without the ability to do something about it. So Nehemiah rides and eventually walks around the city and then he gathers the people together in verse 18 and Nehemiah said let's rebuild this wall some of you remember that moment in June of 1987 Ronald Reagan there on the border of what was East and West Germany you remember remember Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall remember that here's Nehemiah Men and women of Israel, rebuild this wall. You see this wall? Literally, Nehemiah says, you see how bad this is? I'm not going to sugarcoat it to you. It's pretty bad. They'd already, they already knew that. They didn't need Nehemiah to tell them it's bad. They'd been walking by this wall for 70 years. They knew the wall was knocked down. They'd walked by that wall so many times, they'd forgotten that it ever was built. And so now Nehemiah says, let's rebuild this wall. We're going to rebuild this wall. We're going to step up. James reminds us there is a doing that is required to our believing. Faith is doing something about what you say you believe. Faith is trusting God. It's putting our feet to work. So Nehemiah now with careful examination walks around, rides around the city, rides around the walls, that lonely journey around the broken down walls he's perhaps seeing now for the very first time. and Realizing the impact of what had been told him and so he begins to challenge the people. Do you see it? Verse 17, do you see it? The walls are down. I can imagine Nehemiah standing next to maybe one of the broken down sections of the walls or just pointing at the rocks. Do you see that? The walls are broken down. Let's rebuild that. Let's do something about what we say we believe. So the Bible says in verse 18, Nehemiah says, I told them the gracious hand of God was on me and what the king had said. And so they said, let's start rebuilding. 
So hearing the challenge of Nehemiah, who simply said to them, let's do something about what we say we believe about God. And so the people now recognizing the gracious hand of God on Nehemiah agreed, let's start rebuilding. Why do you suppose the people agreed? Well, Nehemiah said it because the gracious hand of God was on me. It's the second time we've heard that in this chapter. The first one was with Artaxerxes. He granted my request because the gracious hand of God was on me. The second time with the people of Israel, they responded to my challenge. Why? Because the gracious hand of God was on me. Maybe you just need to spend some time this week telling somebody about the gracious hand of God. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, not only is the gracious hand of God on you, but the powerful spirit of God is in you. Faith is doing something about what we say we believe. But I want you to note one final thing here about Nehemiah chapter 2. Faith means standing strong even if no one else stands with you. See, not everybody was excited about this rebuilding project. And we meet three men who eventually become thorns in Nehemiah's side, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. We're going to see them now really several times throughout the book of Nehemiah, and you'll kind of become weary of hearing their names, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. And every time God begins to do something through Nehemiah, we'll meet Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem who try to do something to stop it. Sanballat was a leader in Samaria, probably just to the north and west of Jerusalem. Tobiah was an Ammonite official just to the east of Jerusalem. Geshem was an Arabic official just to the south of Jerusalem. Their presence there literally saying, we have you surrounded. And we see a couple of things here that Nehemiah reminds us. So note what the Bible says in verse 10. Right after the king has just granted Nehemiah's request, Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, heard that someone had come to pursue the prosperity of the Israelites. And they were greatly displeased. Isn't that odd? They heard somebody came to do something about the prosperity of the Israelites, and they don't like it. They're not just unhappy, they are greatly displeased. And then we see them again in verse 19. Sanballat, Tobiah, and now there's a third. Geshem heard about this, and they mocked and despised us. Oh, they, they, they just began to make fun of us. What do you think you're doing? We'll see that tactic again. And then they ask what is really a, 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 a painful question, or at least intended to be, what are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Well, of course not. He's got permission to be there. But they're implying that by their very question. Are you rebelling against the king? They don't get it. And opposition rarely does. Opposition doesn't always make sense. Opposition tends to overreact. Opposition makes everybody else's business their business. Opposition mocks when there's no logical reason for opposition. Opposition makes their opposition personal. They despised us. And opposition tends to distort the truth. But look what Nehemiah said. I love Nehemiah's response. It's, it's humorous when you read it in its context. Nehemiah says, I gave them this reply. The God of heaven is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building, but you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Here's what Nehemiah said. It's none of your business. What are you doing rebuilding this city? It's none of your business. Are you rebelling against the king? And Nehemiah said, listen, the God of heaven. Notice that he doesn't say Artaxerxes gave you permission to be here. That might have been the answer that they wanted. Well, Artaxerxes said it was okay. Oh, good, Artaxerxes said it was okay. But that's not what Nehemiah said. Nehemiah said, listen, the God of heaven gave me permission to be here. We're his servants. We're going to build this building. You, by then contrast, not his servants. You have nothing to do with this. This is none of your business. 
We're going to build this city because God said we can build this city. I was remembering the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. He can't understand them because they're spiritual. It would be like if someone was talking to me about, I don't know, rocket science or nuclear physics. I can't understand nuclear physics because I am not a nuclear physician. Physical. I can't understand it. You know why the unspiritual man can't understand spiritual things? Because they're not spiritual. And the moment you begin to try to justify yourself to someone who has no frame of reference to understand, you will find merely confusion rather than support. But maybe opposition is a sign that God's doing something. Maybe opposition is an indicator that they were merely opposing what the gracious hand of God had begun. And so we remember if we had faith, we'd wait even if God hasn't answered. If we had faith, we'd believe even if we don't yet see. If we had faith, we'd act and put feet to our faith. And if we had faith, we'd stand, even if we stand alone. So this morning, I'm challenging you. There's some of you I'm challenging to wait. You've called out a prayer, a burden to the Lord, and God has not answered. And I'm calling on you to wait. Maybe the most spiritual thing you can do right now is nothing but to pray, to believe that the God you have called out to is and will be faithful again. Maybe you need to wait. Some of you need to believe. You just need to accept the fact, I've called out to God and God is going to do it again. In light of everything God has done, why will not you believe that God will be faithful again? And maybe God is merely waiting on you to believe Him, to trust even when you don't yet see. Others of you, I'm challenging to act, to put feet to your faith. You say you believe, now's the moment to step up. Now's the moment to plug in. Now's the moment to serve. Now's the moment to give. Now's the moment to go. Now's the moment to volunteer. Now is the moment to say yes to whatever God is asking of you. Some of you I'm asking to act. And then some of you I'm just asking to stand. Maybe you're facing something in your life or you're in a position where you are standing on your faith, sometimes by yourself. And I'm calling on you to stand. We learn you can trust God when you're waiting. You can trust Him when you're asking. You can trust Him when you're working. And you can trust Him when your faith is questioned. See, faith precedes your actions. It's more important than your plans. It's the assurance of God's faithfulness. It's the basis of your conversations. It's the evidence of what you don't yet see. It's the confidence in God's timing. It's the fuel for your obedience, and it is the source of your endurance. So I want to ask you this morning, why aren't you trusting God more? Nehemiah is a type of Christ in this aspect. We learn in the story, Nehemiah left the king to go rescue his people. And I thought about Jesus, who the Bible says emptied himself and in humility took on the form of a servant and was faithful even to the cross. He left the king to come save his people. So what would happen if we believed him more?